Um, okay, Mark Coleman here for Container Solutions, talking to Ken Owens from Cisco Cloud. Hey, Ken. Hey, how you doing, Mike? Good, good. Um, so we're here today, we're recording this video, which will be released during the Cisco Live event in Berlin in February. Uh, and the subject is going to be about Mantle and Ships and all the cool things you guys are doing at Cisco Cloud right now. Um, but first, for those who are watching who don't know who you are, maybe you could give a little introduction. Yeah, definitely happy to. So I am Ken Owens. I'm the CTO for Cisco's Cloud Group. Uh, I've been focusing on sort of innovation activities, where to, um, how to sort of enhance the adoption of, of cloud services and microservices as this new um, exciting world around us is evolving into containerization and Internet of Things. Cool. So um, now that everyone knows who you are, we're going to talk a little bit about what you've been up to. Uh, so. There's been a lot of noise about Mantle. Um, perhaps you could say in your own words, what exactly is Mantle? Yeah, definitely. Mantle is a kind of an accumulation of all the different open source technologies that sort of a, a developer would require in order to stand up an end-to-end -end solution from the, the development of their code to the pushing of their code out, being able to deploy it across multiple clouds and then be able to collect data and analytics about their application in real time, and then be able to make decisions against that um, and, and kind of the monitoring and, and what's needed to sort of understand everything about the application. And so what we really try to tackle with Mantle is the things like service discovery that are, that are very difficult to do. A lot of, uh, we call it kind of the glue, if you will, of, of building an end-to-end -end platform. We sort of try to tackle all that glue and expose that as, as services and as configuration files that developers can then either just leverage it right out of the box and not make any changes to it, or if they choose, they can come in and customize it and optimize it for their use cases. So it's a bit like, um, because Mantle's built on top of Mesos, but it's, it's a lot more than that. And I right. think what you were leaning towards at the end is that it's gonna be similar to the Docker idea of like batteries included, but you can sort of stick your own stuff in if you want to. Correct, and it's, and it's not tied to any one technology, whereas Docker kind of wants you to use the ecosystem, right? We've, we've sort of made it so it's ex extensible. Docker is definitely part of it, but Docker is only one piece of what's needed in an end-to-end -end platform. Sure. So um, it's it's obviously much more than just a cluster manager, um, and I guess this is this, part, this larger vision is part of where Project Ship fits in. So how do right. the two sort of play, and, and where, where do they both sit in this, this vision that you have? Yeah, ship, SHIP's vision came about as, a, as I looked at the infrastructure as code that's happened over the last four or five years, and how much the, the infrastructure has sort of been automated, and how much easier it is now to get infrastructure up and running. Um, and then I looked at developers trying to develop, and it's so hard for them to build and integrate all their pieces. So when they look at the, how they do project management, how they do CI/CD in this new, you know, new new ecosystem, which is moving more to agile from waterfall, right? So the, mm -hmm. the enterprises are making major shifts from from agile to agile from waterfall. As you know, that's every enterprise is at a different stage in that journey, and some have done it successfully, some have struggled. Um, some are still trying to figure out what it means, right? And so there's there's all kinds of different phases there. And then the piece that I also want to tackle is how do I like maintain this once it's developed, right? Everyone helps you create software, sure. But once you once you want to deploy it somewhere, no one really has a great way to help you deploy that software. And then once once you deploy it, no one really has a great way to help you manage it and maintain it from that point on, right? And so right. shipped. Was, was sort of like, how do, we, how do we address the modern DevOps movement? And we, we looked at it from the standpoint of, let's break it into the three pieces that, that really matter to the developer. Let's, look at the, let's focus on the build piece. Let's make it easier for them to build. So when you think about something like, you know, Vagrant Up, the idea was to do like Mantle Up, right? So you could start off ship by just saying Mantle Up. And everything you need for your development build platform is integrated into your laptop. So Vagrant comes up, VMs start being deployed with microservices that you said you wanted to play with. Um, it, it plugs into Docker Hub, so you can bring in a Docker Hub components and configure them if you wish. And then the second piece was deploy. So we've kind of separated 
the different deployment locations and said, you, let's let developers sort of select where they want to deploy to. Or IT could define here are your deployment locations. And so the build and the deploy are separated, but yet you test it all together on your laptop. So we, we can kind of give you an environment that lets you test it as if you were deploying to Amazon. And then when you go to deploy and you, you set up your account with Amazon, you can deploy it from your laptop to Amazon as you'd expect you can. And then the last piece is run. How do we maintain it? How do we help you in, in, in integrate new code? How do we help you update it? How do we help you manage and monitor what's happening with your code? So all three of those pieces we attacked with Shipped, and Mantle was sort of the underlying, initial underlying platform that Shipped uses. Um, we worked with Cloud Foundry and have a Cloud Foundry release coming up, and at Cisco Live were announced as well then. Um, we also worked with other platforms like OpenShift we've integrated with. So we have a Kubernetes integration now, and, and OpenShift is coming up, and we'll announce that at Cisco Live in Berlin. So, you know, kind of making it platform agnostic, even though we've tied it into Mantle to begin with as a starting point, it's still going to support other platforms besides just Mantle. Like that's kind of how Shift and Mantle fit together. Okay, so the, so the idea is that as a developer, um, Shift allows, like gives me all the things I care about, and underneath it's using Mantle to do things which I've been forced to care about, but I actually don't care about. Right. Okay. And if you do care about them, you can use the Mantle API or UI to go in and modify and manage them and optimize those components. But if you're a developer who doesn't want to care about those pieces, it's all there and it's already managed for you on your behalf. Sure. Okay. So it's very much um, the idea of like the developer centric workflow that, that you're sort of right. coming from here. So like, let's care about building the right. application and less about how everything sticks together underneath. Exactly. So, um, this sounds like the sort of cloud native idea. Um, the cloud native uh, computing foundation has launched recently. And we see a lot of noise around that. What's your involvement there and how does Mantle fit into that picture? Do you think? Yeah, definitely. So Cisco is a, a platinum um, member of the cloud native computing foundation. And we're also on the board for the, um, the, um, Container Open Container Initiative, so OCI, yeah. and so we're, we're we're involved in both of these initiatives primarily from the standpoint that we feel like it's important that um, containers and and microservices in general have some you know there's been a lot of noise about them there's been a lot of people trying them out but we need to have some sort of, of industry recognition and standardization around what's the right way to leverage these sort of environments sure. right. Um, in some cases, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, maybe that you know VMs may or may not be part of this this you know, cloud native environment. Um, how bare metal works with containers is still something that you know hasn't really been well defined. There's a lot of security and networking concerns, and mm -hmm. so from from a Cisco standpoint, we kind of look at it as as a way to help level set what's the enterprise use cases and needs around containers mm -hmm. and cloud native development. And how do we, from a network and security standpoint, help provide better um, requirements to the industry in terms of what's needed to really make this work in a, in a cloud native infrastructure of the future? With regards to bare metal, is that something, um, do, do you see VMs sliding out in the near term? I, I mean, are you pushing to move towards bare metal as soon as possible, or are you sort of waiting to see where the market's going to go? You know, I, my, my, my personal view, and maybe not so much Cisco's view, right? But my personal view is that, that VMs are not going to be a long-term solution, primarily because of the complexity around the virtualization environment, the number of, of systems you have to install and manage and maintain separately from your application stack, right? Um, but probably sure. most importantly, the performance hit. And, and, and not that everything cloud-native needs high performance, but as you're looking at, at the use cases around analytics and around, you know, real time um, performance in, a, in an environment that today is very much driven by usability from an end user standpoint, end users are really thriving and demanding better performing and, and better available solutions. Um, I feel like VMs are not going to meet those needs long term. So long term, I think VMs are not going to be as relevant as they are today. I think containers. And, and what comes next, you know, I, 
I'm not a, I'm not one of these people who believes containers is the end solution. There's always something new, right? And, sure. and containers that you know have been around for, for 15, 20 years, right? So mm-hmm. It's not a new, LXC is not new. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's not like we discovered something new here. It's just we've, we've, we've been figuring a way to kind of take something that provides a little bit of separation, a little bit of kind of um, what I could call system engineering of an application, right? Breaking your complex solution into smaller components that you can then um, run and operate and maintain independently of each other. It's just good engineering practice. And so I think containers fits that model better than VMs, which really, for the most part, just said take your physical and make it virtual, right? It, it right. really didn't solve any of the problems that we needed to solve from you know, we still have we have VM sprawl now. We used to have container sprawl. Now we have VM. Now we used to have service sprawl. Now we have VM sprawl. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we'll have container sprawl. I kind of doubt we will, just because containers are ephemeral by nature, so yep. we won't have the same problem. But um, I think we keep kind of my my point is, I guess it'd be nice to kind of stop pushing the same problems to the to the developers again and again and again, and mm-hmm. let's solve some of the problems that developers face every day in a way that allows them to get their job done better, not not make it more complicated for them to get their job done. So we've segued beautifully to the last section, which is which is going to be all about the future. Um, so you've already given your prediction for the demise of VMs. Um, another thing I heard about uh, or saw a very cool little demo of was App Intent. Um, Where's that on the on the sort of radar right now? Is that is that like still thoughtware, or is it is it is it happening? Are we going to see it in the next year? Yeah, yeah. App Intent is an interesting, um, and there's a few other things I'll, I'll touch on with that too. They're interesting that we're working on, but um, there's this this concept that Cisco has had for a long time that sort of application or network aware application development, right? And it's been kind of tackled at the infrastructure layer. So we have a, a, with SDN, software defined networking, we have these APIC um, application policy infrastructure centric nodes, right, and controllers. And so as as soft as infrastructure has become code, and we've addressed SDN with a um, application policy centric model, we're looking at you know endpoints and how do we provide local policy on these endpoints. We think about global policy. But it's really very much infrastructure centric, networking and ACLs and ports and protocols, right? It's what you'd expect an ACL to look like, right? Mm -hmm. Um, As I thought about that and I thought about what we're doing with Shift and Mantle, what dawned on me is that, you know, developers don't typically know for sure, or I guess I should say it depends, right? Their application performance needs depend on lots of variables, right? Right. And um, most of them, if you, if you, most enterprises look at this in, on two at uh, two extremes, right? Either you plan for the worst case scenario and you over provision the heck out of your infrastructure, right? Yep. Or you plan for the the least case scenario, in which case your application goes down whenever you have a spike because you never plan for the excess needs, right? Sure. Um, and elasticity is not as easy as just saying it's an elastic app, right? It takes work to make something elastic, and so right. as I looked at that problem, I was like, you know. Cisco has a solution for this problem, but we don't have a great way of defining it in business language. And so application policy intent was sort of evolved from how would I, as a developer, classify or characterize my application needs at a business level. And then we came up with some graphics and some visuals to kind of help a developer understand what the trade-offs are between more security or less security and more of a CPU or less CPU. I kind of, you know, kind of give them a visual of what it would look like. And then that kind of led naturally to how do you compose an application, right? Because today it's it's not easy to say my application needs these six different services, right? It's, it's very much a uh, manual install this RPM, install that RPM. Yeah. You know, don't configure this file to connect to these different services. And so... We like, I was like, well, what if we made it almost like a, not a wizard, because that's kind of a bad 1980s term, right? But it, <laughs> how do we kind of create a, a very simple user experience? It's, I guess, the 19, you know, the 2000s term now, yeah. at least, I mean, closer. Uh, you know, how do we kind of create a user experience that lets a developer kind of select a, a service, select how, you know, if they want, like, the free version of it, they want to pay for the, you know, the, the low-end version, they want to pay for a premium version, you know, kind of a, 
a Haruku kind of experience, right? Right. Um, define that application, compose it in a certain way, create policies for the services, not just a generic, you know, I need an ACL, but this service should get connected to this service, and I expect this bandwidth to be always available, right? I expect this network to never go down. Right. And that's really, at, that's really at the level that app policy intends to add. It's a very simple, give me a business level objective for what I expect you to provide me as an infrastructure provider. And then what we do inside under the covers, like we're doing with Mantle, our idea is to then use a policy engine to sort of knowing Amazon and Google and Microsoft and OpenStack clouds, as long as, soon as, as long as we know kind of, as long as we have a profile of the cloud and we've created a, a, a plugin to connect to that cloud to deploy, we can pretty much understand what the performance characteristics of that environment will be like. Yeah. We can deploy it into that environment and then collect data and report back in real time what's happening and, and also let you kind of look at the last week, the last month, kind of get a profile of how that application is performing. Is it coming close to what your needs were? And if not, we're going to let you simulate a change. So mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of, a lot of developers and, and infrastructure teams have to sort of play with, with the app or with the infrastructure to kind of see, sure. can we tweak this? Now let's watch what happens, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of built the simulator into the whole experience. So you could simulate a change. And then we actually use the real t data. We don't create synthetic data. We actually use real data that we've captured and monitored over the last several weeks on that environment to tell you what would actually happen if you did make that change. And if you want to make it, you just hit apply. It's that simple. As, you know, I, I call it the easy button, right? The little stable <laughs> button. Just hit apply. We apply it. And we if you keep collecting the data. We'll keep the history, right? So you can... You can kind of go back in time and see, okay, here's my app performance. I made this change. Then my app performance became this. I, you know, after a couple of weeks, it wasn't what I wanted, so I made this change. And so we can show you each change. We can keep track of who made that change. Sure. Um, it has some, like, accountability there for governance purposes. And you have history to kind of say, look, we made these changes. Here's what happened. Um, and either it's a, it was a good change or it was a bad change, but at least you have the data and you can make decisions on that data now, whereas before it, it was very complicated to try to make any of these sort of changes. So that's the app intent piece, the composability piece that's coming. Um, the last thing I want to add to it, this is the, the data platform, that analytics piece I just mentioned and the, and the ability to simulate, that's also coming very soon. All of this is, is just a few, um, a few iterations away. So by summer, um, June, June timeframe, when we go to Cisco Live, um, Sandy, um, is in Vegas this year, so Cisco Live in July. Mm -hmm. So by the July time frame, we will have a GA of this sort of capability in the system. And so it's not too far out, but it, it's not today. You know, so it's sort of it's going to take a little while to get there. And um, my philosophy is is sort of a let's get version one out there. That's eighty percent of what we want it to be. Sure. And then let's see what the industry tells us and how how the what the developers think and how what input they give us on it as well as let's look at what's ha happening around us in the environment and in the open source community. And let's try to take advantage of enhancements and changes to what is available to us at the same time and then iterate as quickly as we can from that point on. Uh, Ken, I think that's a perfect point of which to end. It sounds like you've got huge plans for 2016 and I'm personally looking very much forward to seeing how it goes. Uh, thank you again for your time and I look forward to seeing you in Berlin. Thank you for your time, and I really appreciate the support that you guys are giving us at Container Solutions. You've been a great partner, and um, I really like working with you guys. So keep up the great work. Thanks, Thanks Ken. Good night.